And now, time for your weekly mushroom news. How's it going? We are here with your news. That's right, we're doing news because mushrooms save the world. And that's newsworthy if you ask me because what we hear on the news nowadays is garbage entertainment. And it's not even really entertainment. So, here we are, we're going to do some real news. And the story that we're going to do today is oyster mushrooms help clean up after California's wildfires. Why is it so hard to make a business case for microremediation? So let's just get into this. When wildfires burned across Northern California in October of 2017, they killed at least 43 people and displaced another 100,000 people. The human toll alone was dire, but the fires alone left behind a toxic mess. It wasn't just the record-breaking levels of air pollution. The blazes generated an untold amount of potentially dangerous ash. The remains of incinerated hazardous household waste and building materials. The charred, yeah, that word, of paint, pesticides, cleaning products, electronics, pressure-treated wood, and propane tanks left a range of pollutants in the soil, including arsenic, asbestos, copper, hexavalent chromium, lead, and zinc. That's not stuff that we want in our soil. Not at all. We gotta get that out of our soil. Because we gotta grow from our soil. Officials feared runoff from the toxic ash could pollute local creeks once the rainy season hit, potentially tainting the drinking water supply from the region's 700,000 residents. I mean, 700,000 people, 700,000 people need water. I mean, we can't have tainted water. So, what are we going to do? In the aftermath of the fires, federal and state workers removed much of the toxic debris. But then in Sonoma County, a coalition of fire remediation experts, local businesses, and ecological activists mobilized the cleanse foundations of burned out buildings with mushrooms. What? The Fire Remediation Action Coalition placed more than 40 miles of wattles, straw-filled snake-like tubes designed to prevent erosion, inoculated with oyster mushrooms around parking lots, along roads, and across hillsides. Their plan, the tubes would provide makeshift channels diverting runoff from the sensitive waterways. The mushrooms would do the rest of the work. That's what they do. Mycelia digests whatever surface they're growing on, converting it to nutrients and depending on the surface, edible mushrooms. That clicking is not good. The volunteers led by landscape professional Eric Olson are advocates for micro-remediation, an experimental bioremediation technique that uses mushrooms to clean up hazardous waste, harnessing their natural ability to use enzymes to break down foreign substances. In the last 15 years, fungi enthusiast and so-called citizen scientist have deployed mushrooms to clean up oil spills in the Amazon, boat fuel, pollution, eh, boat fuel pollution in Denmark, contaminated oil in New Zealand, and polychlorinated by phen eh, and polychlorinated by phenols, more commonly known as PCBs, in Washington, Spokane River. Spokane, 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 whatever, that river. Researchers suggest mushrooms can convert pesticides and herbicides to more innocuous compounds, removing heavy metals from brownfield sites, and break down plastic. They have even been used to remove and recover heavy metals from contaminated water. Also, you can pull heavy metals out of the soil. So if like your garden has heavy metals in there, what you do is you plant some moisture mushrooms in there, let them flush a few times, then test your soil. I don't know if they go over that or not. It's the roots mycelia that do all the work, says Daniel Reyes, founder of the Austin, Texas-based science of education company Myco Alliance, referring to the thread-like network of roots that connect species of fungi compared to an apple tree. Man, this guy really should put a little bit more punctuation in. I apologize. Compared to an apple tree, the mushroom we see growing above ground is the apple and the mycelium is the tree itself. Mycologists focus on the mycelium, he says. Mycelia consume their food externally by secreting powerful enzymes that break down molecules. In other words, they digest whatever substrate or surface they're growing on, converting it into nutrients and depending on the substrate, edible mushrooms. Proponents say it's natural, more benign, and potentially cheaper alternative to the scrape and burn approach to the environmental cleanup, which involves digging up contaminated soil and incinerating it. Here, we're converting it to food for the mushrooms. Mushrooms grow. Mushrooms save the world. So why is micro-remediation a more common practice? One reason, Hualala says, is that the federal regulations require the removal of 100% of targeted contaminants within a short time frame. Current micro-remediation solutions simply work too slowly to, to be embraced on an industrial scale. 
In nature, mushrooms break down all kinds of substances, and we're just beginning to look at this more closely in the lab and in field studies, she says. But we don't know yet but we don't but we don't yet know the speed of the breakdown and how effective that breakdown is. As a result, most microremediation projects are undertaken at the local level, like Sonoma County projects. Mycology is a very neglected as a science, and microremediation is currently very site specific, says Peter McCoy, a self trained mycologist viewed by many of his adherents as his founder as a founder of the radical mycology movement. His books, Radical Mycology, uh, and another one. McCoy says there are no one size fit all methods for applying mushrooms to biohazard sites. Reactions vary depending on the species of mushrooms, contaminants present, and local growing conditions, which mean treatments must be customized and that further exploration is likely necessary. And that is one way that mushrooms are going to save the world. This channel, we're going to go through tons of ways. This isn't going to be a frequently uploaded channel. I'd like to do it once a week. That I don't want to really go too much more than that. And then maybe twice a week at the end of the month when Johns Hopkins comes out with their newsletters. I'm kind of a fan of reading them. So maybe we'll share them if you want to. Let me know. Um, and it's at this point in time, I'd like to thank you for your time. It's all we have. It doesn't exist. If you guys made your way here from one of my other channels, don't comment what it is down below, please, because I'm not talking about it yet over there. <laughs> Bye.